In 48 hours, 19 heads of states and their entourage will be in Delhi. How has India's G20 presidency been? What have been the highlights and takeaways? Former Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, is joining me live from Melbourne. Mr. Abbott, really appreciate your time. India has pitched its presidency as people's presidency. It has taken this opportunity to showcase its diversity to the world. As a former Prime Minister and someone who hosted G20 in 2014, how do you think India shaped this grouping? Well, I certainly think that the G20 presidency has been a wonderful chance for India to showcase itself to the world. India is now the world's fifth largest economy. It's the world's fastest growing large economy. It's the world's most populous nation. Under Narendra Modi, uh, India is taking a much more outward looking uh, position on global issues. Uh, Narendra Modi is a transformative leader, uh, both uh, domestically and globally. Uh, I think really uh, this has been a coming of age for India as the emerging democratic global superpower. And uh, the G20 has just been a wonderful opportunity uh, for the world to uh, sit up and take notice of just how much India is transforming right now under the Modi government. And Mr. Abbott, uh, when it comes to Australia, uh, India interests, uh, what are the economic outcomes and challenges so far and what are the points of convergences? Well, obviously, Australia is the first major economy in, in recent times to have done a, a very thoroughgoing uh, free trade deal with India. Uh, that was concluded about 12 months ago. It's probably the best deal that India has done uh, with any other uh, significant economy. And I'm confident that what was an underdeveloped economic relationship uh, can grow and grow strongly and grow fast. Um, you see, uh, for several decades, uh, Australia had a China focus, but really India was always a much more natural partner for a country such as Australia because India has the priceless gifts of democracy, the rule of law, uh, to a considerable extent, the English language, and there are also ties of history between Australia and India, which we shouldn't forget. So I think we've really woken up to the fact that uh, Australia and India are, are natural partners. And obviously, the fact that there is plainly so much strategic competition uh, between countries like Australia now and China, uh, that is obviously a challenge to the world. But it's a great opportunity for India because India has the, sc the scale uh, to substitute for China uh, as uh, uh, the democratic world's great manufacturing workshop. And in terms of uh, the single biggest achievement of India's G20 presidency, uh, what do you think it was? And it has been. Well, look... Um, you know, the great thing about uh, uh, these big global conferences, uh, particularly something like the G20 presidency, which is really a rolling series of high-level meetings, not just of senior leaders in government, but senior leaders in business and civil society as well, uh, is that um, it, 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 show, it showcases uh, the country that holds the presidency to the world. And all of those people who used to say things like India is a country of great potential and always will be are waking up to the fact that India is now uh, on the runway, uh, taking off in the way that China was uh, two decades ago. For instance, it's impossible to go to an Indian city of any size without noticing an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, infrastructure program. I mean, the motorways that are building, uh, the subways that are building, um, the airports that are building, uh, this is a sign uh, of a country 
which really is unlocking its vast potential. And in the case of India, its vast potential for good, uh, because uh, while India doesn't always get uh, the press it deserves, India has a riotously free press, uh, an absolutely uh, vigorous and fair democracy, and a robustly independent judiciary. And again, uh, this is some of what makes India a natural partner for a country like Australia. And uh, uh, Mr. Abbott, India's presidency certainly comes in the backdrop of two black swan events, which is the Ukraine-Russia conflict and COVID-19. Would you say mm -hmm. India had to deal with more complex disagreements? Uh, or, uh, and, and do you see these as some kind of hindrance to a possible joint communique? Well, look, uh, I don't say that uh, India hasn't had to uh, weave its way through uh, the odd uh, political minefield, but uh, I was very conscious of uh, Narendra Modi's words to Vladimir Putin uh, when they met a few months ago in Tashkent. Uh, I accept that India has uh, a long-standing friendship with Russia, um, dating back to a time when the United States was perhaps uh, less well advised in its policies towards India. Uh, but uh, I think India uh, has managed uh, so far uh, to strengthen its relationships with countries like uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom and Australia, um, notwithstanding the fact that it has this uh, long-standing historical indebtedness uh, to Russia. Uh, I think the fact that uh, India has been able to um, uh, avoid condemning Russia <laughs> without jeopardising its other key relationships uh, is a tribute to the diplomatic sure-footedness of uh, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar uh, and the Indian government more generally. That said, uh, what Russia is doing in Ukraine is simply evil. It is simply evil. Uh, and the sooner the world wakes up to this, the better. Talking about Australia-China here, uh, Australia-China relations are at a very interesting crossroads, I would say, mm -hmm. right now with leaders meeting after nearly six years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that meeting happened earlier this year. You had called China a bully in the past. Xi Jinping mm. is not visiting India for the leaders' summit. Some would say China has become isolated and their presence not as significant as they are made out to be. Uh, what would be your thoughts on this? Well, I do think it is quite significant that uh, President Xi is not participating in the Indian G20 event. Um, and this does give India really a, a, an even bigger chance to shine. Um, this really does highlight uh, India's contemporary opportunity uh, to substitute for China uh, in so many ways and to be a vastly more benign and collegial partner to countries than China ever has been and indeed ever could be, uh, at least while it's under the current uh, communist regime in Beijing. So, look, um, I think this has been a, a very good year for India. Uh, and I think that India's standing on the world stage will be immensely enhanced by the G20 conference, which is about to take place. And the fact that President Xi is sulking in Beijing uh, just makes India's opportunity and uh, Narendra Modi's triumph all the greater. And, uh, you know, let's look at some, uh, some issues that seem to have emerged or narratives which have emerged in the last 10 months of India's G20 presidency. Uh, Mr. Abbott, at the 15th BRICS summit in Johannesburg, uh, we saw six new countries added to that grouping, which included Ethiopia, Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Argentina. And, you know, this was also a realization that uh, an acceptance of the changing nature of the world order uh, and a reiteration of the new world order. Prime Minister Narendra Modi 
has played a critical role in being the voice of the developing nations. Uh, he has also written to the G20 members uh, that there is a the time has come to include African nation, uh, particularly the African Union, I would say, in this grouping. Would you say that this is very, very essential that India becomes that voice and uh, these groupings must reflect the aspirations of all those countries who really did not have a voice for the longest time? Mm. Look, uh, I think that the best thing for any decent country uh, is to be a voice for justice and a voice for the universal aspirations of mankind. And uh, what do people want? Uh, people want a, a fair society. They want a prosperous economy. Uh, and they want their country to be free from uh, aggression from larger neighbours. Now, India, to its great credit, hasn't just talked the talk. It's very much walked the walk uh, ever since 1947. So I think India has been uh, an example of good global citizenship, but particularly in recent times under the more outward-looking leadership of Narendra Modi. So if I were uh, thinking about the Indian achievement, uh, I wouldn't see myself especially uh, as leading this group or that group uh, i would i would try to see myself as 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 speaking fairly and justly uh, to the whole world uh, rather than setting oneself up as a spokes country if you like for any particular group and uh, you know this focus that india has put the prime minister um, stressing on the global south and he has sought focus on the most vulnerable citizens of the world. Uh, he has posed the ideas of human-centric development and what we saw in the month of January when India had organized the largest digital conference um, in mm -hmm. which 125 nations participated, the Global South, which is now being seen as an aspirational emerging block which can tilt the focus in the favor of the East. Uh, many would say it is dismantling the long-held hegemony of econom uh, economic West. Uh, mm. How do you see India's role in this transition? Well, certainly uh, uh, the way India has digitised uh, so rapidly uh, of late uh, has, has helped to transform uh, the Indian economy and has helped to transform the lives of, of hundreds of millions of people. So India is a marvellous example of uh, just how uh, digitization can make a difference for people who would be otherwise still in a quasi subsistence economy. So that's, uh, that's really quite wonderful. But frankly, uh, by far the most significant thing that India has done in recent times is uh, make possible the quad. Uh, that's really the most significant thing that India has done in recent times. And the quad would not have happened but for two people. First of all, the late Shinzo Abe of Japan, uh, and secondly, and very importantly, Narendra Modi uh, of India. Uh, but for those two, the Quad would not have happened. And while the Quad is not a military alliance, it's not a security partnership, it's really, I suppose, a, a democratic tendency, um, it's a great force for good, particularly in the face of an increasingly belligerent Beijing. My last question to you, Mr. Abbott, um, and we are extending this theme of inclusivity. India has often stressed that the world order created after World War II has become archaic and it lacks the ability to solve today's problems such as, uh, you know, democratization and reform of multilateral institutions. And that is really the need of the hour. Is India's mm. aspiration of being the UNSC driving force behind this international discourse um, or a compelling desire to see a more multipolar world or would you say it's a bit of both? Well, the world is inevitably becoming more multipolar uh, with the emergence of countries such as India as uh, economic uh, powerhouses and ultimately with the, the strategic cloud to match. Uh, and I suppose at some point in the not too distant future, 
countries like Indonesia will start to emerge uh, as well, most likely. But uh, um, I, I really think that uh, what India has, has, has done well, uh, it has taken advantages of all the op- taken advantage of all the opportunities uh, that the post-war global order has given it, uh, particularly in recent years under Narendra Modi. Uh, let's not forget uh, that the um, globalized world, which uh, uh, started to flourish particularly um, in the 1990s and beyond, uh, under American leadership, if you like, uh, but embracing countries like India uh, has produced a world that, at least until COVID hit us, was uh, freer, fairer, richer and safer than at any time in human history. Um, and uh, what we've seen over the last three and four decades is uh, the rise of literally billions of people in countries like India, and yes, in China too, but also in uh, so many other countries and, and, and even in parts of Africa now, we've seen the rise of billions of people from relative poverty uh, to a degree of affluence. And this is something that is really wonderful. Uh, it's a transformation unparalleled in history in terms of its speed and size. And, and yes, this has happened um, under a world order uh, led by America um, and, and founded on uh, market principles, uh, democracy, uh, and a notion of fundamental human rights. And I think that uh, whatever things still need to be improved, we should give credit where it's due. All right. Uh, Mr. Abbott, really appreciate your time. Thank you for speaking to NDTV. And I hope to have another round of conversation after the G20 Heads of States meeting gets over here in New Delhi. Thank you so much.